Hello, and welcome to the LSB Industries First Quarter 2024 Earnings Conference Call. If anyone should require operator assistance, please press star zero on your telephone keypad. A question and answer session will follow the formal presentation. You may be placed in the question queue at any time by pressing star one on your telephone keypad. We ask you please limit yourselves to one question and one follow-up. As a reminder, this conference is being recorded. It's now my pleasure to turn the call over to Fred Bonacourt, Vice President, Investor Relations. Fred, please go ahead. Good morning, everyone. Joining me today are Mark Bierman, our Chief Executive Officer, and Cheryl McGuire, our Chief Financial Officer. Also joining us today is Damian Renwick, our Chief Commercial Officer. Please note that today's call includes forward-looking statements. These statements are based on the company's current intent, expectations, and projections. They are not guarantees of future performance, and a variety of factors could cause the actual results to differ materially. On the call, we will reference non-GAAP results. Please see the press release in the Investors section of our website, lsbindustries.com, for further information regarding forward-looking statements and reconciliations of non-GAAP results to GAAP results. As a reminder, we have a stockholder rights plan to protect certain tax attributes. Please see the investor section of our website at lsbindustries.com for further important details. At this time, I'd like to go ahead and turn the call over to Mark. Thank you, Fred. Turning to page four of our presentation, first quarter results were in line with our expectations. Pricing was down year over year, but this was offset somewhat by stronger sales volumes and lower natural gas costs. We continued to generate positive free cash flow in the first quarter and used our strong cash position to repurchase our stock, returning capital to our shareholders. We also reduced our debt by repurchasing notes during the quarter, further de-risking our balance sheet. We continued to selectively repurchase our stock and notes post the first quarter and will seek opportunities to further both of those efforts. Lastly, on the low carbon ammonia initiatives, our two projects remain on track with the timelines that we discussed back in March, and I'll provide more color on these later in the call. Now I'm pleased to turn the call over to Damian Renwick, our Chief Commercial Officer, who will discuss the current market dynamics and pricing trends. Damian? Thanks, Mark, and good morning, everyone. I'm glad to speak with you today. On page five of our presentation, you'll see an overview of our agricultural end market. Corn prices remain at levels that should translate into healthy income levels for farmers. Despite expectations for increasing US corn supply in the coming months, the December 24 corn futures price currently exceeds $4.60 per bushel. The USDA recently reduced 2023-24 global stock estimates for key grains, including corn, providing some price support. In addition, the EPA recently extended the sale of 15% ethanol gasoline, or E15, during the summer, which should provide further support for corn prices. We believe that farmers will remain motivated to maximise corn yields through the application of nitrogen fertilisers for the balance of the spring planting season and again in the fall after the harvest. Ammonia prices have been underpinned by robust demand over the past several months with a strong pre-plant application season in the US. We also saw a variety of factors constraining global supply. This includes a number of cold weather related events in the US impacting domestic production, the disruption of shipping through the Suez Canal, the delayed start-up of new ammonia production capacity that was expected to come online early this year, and natural gas supply issues in Trinidad. We also saw improved UAN pricing develop through Q1 as we continued to successfully execute our direct-to-customer marketing strategy. This allowed us to target pockets of demand where supply was limited as the UAN import pace continued below previous years. Urea prices were volatile in the quarter due to expectations of a resumption of Chinese exports, a dynamic that is has historically had a negative impact on global urea prices. However, the Chinese government recently implemented further restrictions on urea exports, delaying the infusion of additional supply into the global market. While we don't sell urea, 
we do pay close attention to its pricing dynamics since urea pricing can impact pricing for our UAN and HDAN products. As we look forward through the remainder of the fertiliser season, our order book is well positioned across our products to support our market perspectives on pricing and demand through May and early June. We have a good balance of forward orders with room to take advantage of spot sales through the application period depending on the product. On page 6, we show pricing trends and forecasts for the key commodities that drive our agricultural business. The upper left-hand chart shows the price trend for the TTF, the European Natural Gas Pricing Benchmark, relative to the price for Henry Hub, the benchmark price for US natural gas pricing. European gas prices have increased over the last month as instability in the Middle East has offset some of the price decrease seen through the end of 2023 and through Q1 following a warm winter and heavy LNG imports. Still, gas prices in the US remain a fraction of those in Europe, representing significant competitive advantage to US producers. We believe the US cost advantage will persist in the coming years, as the chart indicates. Page 7 summarises some key dynamics at play in our industrial and mining end markets. Overall demand remains steady in our industrial business, reflecting the resilience of the US economy. A significant amount of the nitric acid we sell is used to produce polyurethane. Polyurethane, used to make foams, is a major input to both auto and furniture manufacturing. As such, we closely track data related to US auto production and furniture orders. The first two charts on the right-hand side show trends in US auto production and furniture manufacturing. The trends depicted on these two charts reflect the solid level of demand remaining generally stable over the past year that we experienced in our nitric acid sales. As the third chart on slide 7 indicates, mining production activity also remained relatively stable over the past several years. The recent decline in activity shown in the chart is largely due to a reduction in coal production volumes, reflected in the steep drop in the price of coal over the past year. We have very little exposure to the coal market, so this weakness had minimal impact on our business. On the contrary, we've experienced strong demand for ammonium nitrate, driven in part by healthy metals mining activity in support of electric vehicle production and other applications. The strong demand for metals is reflected in recent price trends for gold and copper, both of which are up significantly this year. As we look at both sides of our business, we expect fundamentals for nitrogen producers to remain attractive and stable for the foreseeable future. Now I'll turn the call over to Cheryl to discuss our first quarter financial results and our outlook. Cheryl? Thanks, Damien, and good morning. On page 8, you'll see a summary of our first quarter 2024 financial results. We generated adjusted EBITDA of $33 million and EPS of $0.08 cents for the first quarter. Page 9 bridges our $33 million of adjusted EBITDA to our first quarter 2023 adjusted EBITDA of $51 million. Weaker selling prices relative to the prior year were once again the primary factor in the year-over-year -year change in EBITDA. The weaker pricing was partially offset by stronger sales volumes and lower natural gas costs. Page 10 provides a summary of our key balance sheet and cash flow metrics. We continue to use our strong cash position as an opportunity to further de-risk our balance sheet. In the first quarter, we repurchased $33 million of our notes, and year-to-date, we've repurchased $75 million of debt. We also repurchased approximately 700,000 shares of our stock during the first quarter and approximately 1.5 million shares year-to-date. We expect to opportunistically repurchase stock as the year pro progresses while continuing to invest in our assets to improve their performance. As a reminder, we have turnarounds scheduled at our prior and Cherokee facilities during the second half of this year. These turnarounds will be integral to our goal to improve plant reliability and efficiency. Looking forward, the second quarter of 2024, Tampa Ammonia currently sits at $450 per metric ton, and NOLA UAN is currently around $270 per ton. 
We expect some weakening in pricing for both products in the second quarter as we move into the normal seasonal slowdown as the spring planting season closes. More specifically, we expect a sequential decline in our realized pricing for ammonia and our ammonia sales volumes given the strong spring ammonia run in the latter part of the first quarter. Additionally, the second quarter typically marks the transition away from ammonia fertilizer application, which is usually done prior to planting, to the application of other fertilizers such as UAN, which are typically applied post-planting. As a result, we expect higher UAN sales volumes both sequentially and year over year. Furthermore, although we anticipate lower realized fertilizer selling prices compared to last year's second quarter, we do expect that impact to be largely offset by lower natural gas costs, which we expect will be approximately $2.10 per MMBTU in the second quarter, inclusive of transportation. With respect to costs, we are ramping up our preparation for our prior and Cherokee turnarounds planned for the second half of 2024. We expect to incur approximately two to three million of expense related to this prep work during the second quarter. Putting it all together, we expect our second quarter adjusted EBITDA to be lower than the second quarter of 2023, primarily due to lower realized selling prices. However, we expect a meaningful sequential increase in adjusted EBITDA over the 2024 first quarter as a result of higher sales volumes and lower natural gas costs. Looking beyond the second quarter, after six consecutive quarters of year-over-year declines in product selling prices, we expect pricing to be more in line with prior year quarters during the second half of this year. And now I'll turn it back over to Mark. Thank you, Cheryl. Pages 11 and 12 pertain to the two low-carbon ammonia projects that we currently have underway. Page 11 summarizes the key information relating to our project with Lapis Energy at our El Dorado facility. This project remains on track with the timeline we discussed in early March. The main gating factor remains the approval of our Class 6 permit application from the EPA. Receiving the Class 6 approval will enable Lapis to commence construction and then begin capturing and permanently sequestering more than 450,000 tons, metric tons per year of CO2 that we produce at El Dorado. We are in regular contact with the EPA about the permit application. We've been encouraged by the recent feedback indicating that the timeline for approval could be accelerated to mid-2025 relative to our previous expectations at the end of 2025. As a reminder, we expect LAPIS to receive the 45Q tax credit of $85 per ton of CO2 sequestered since they will own the capture facility, but they will buy the CO2 from us. At the same time, we will be producing more than 375,000 tons of low-carbon ammonia annually. Collectively, we expect this to yield approximately $15 to $20 million in annual incremental EBITDA for LSB. As we indicated last quarter, our commercial team is actively pursuing markets for the low-carbon products that we will be producing at El Dorado, and our conversations to date have been very productive. Page 12 summarizes the key aspects of our Houston Ship Channel Low Carbon Ammonia Project. As a reminder, the project entails the design and construction of a world-scale ammonia plant that will produce approximately 1.1 million metric tons of low carbon ammonia. Samsung Engineering is performing our pre-feed, and that is expected to be completed during the third quarter of this year, at which point we expect the feed to begin. We anticipate a final investment decision in the second half of next year. Regarding long-term offtake, we continue to work with potential customers to secure long-term offtake for the anticipated ammonia production. Based on our ongoing conversations, we expect offtakers to come from Asia, Europe, and the U.S. The markets for low-carbon ammonia continue to take shape, with many positive developments emerging in recent months. JERA, Japan's largest power company, has a three-month trial underway using 20% ammonia to co-fire one of its coal-burning power plants with the goal of eventually using 100% ammonia in its plants as a means of dramatically reducing its CO2 emissions. The success of this trial would be groundbreaking in terms of providing the viability of ammonia use for large-scale power generation. While Japan is a first mover in this regard, 
Europe, which has previously been entirely focused on green zero-carbon power generation, is increasingly considering blue or low-carbon ammonia as a more practical emission reduction option. This is largely due to the currently prohibitive high costs of producing green fuels. European governments are currently working on legislation intended to make low-carbon ammonia eligible for the incentives that now cover only green products. If this legislation passes, the global market for blue ammonia would be considerably larger than anticipated when we initially began the process of developing our projects. The marine industry is also keenly focused on ammonia as a potential fuel for large ships instead of high CO2 emitting diesel or bunker fuel. Fortescue, an Australian materials and industrials company, successfully used ammonia in combination with diesel as a marine fuel on one of its Singapore-based vessels. Interest in ammonia as a fuel continues to grow, and there are numerous ammonia-powered vessels on order and scheduled for delivery and entry into service as soon as 2026. We're very excited to be involved in this emerging clean fuel trend and expect to be one of the leading suppliers of low-carbon ammonia to, to these and other industries in the coming years. We have a lot of initiatives ongoing to improve our current operations that we believe will provide a meaningful increase in profitability and, in turn, shareholder value. Combining those with our low-carbon activities, we believe we are on our way to creating a profitable play on the energy transition. I'm excited about our future. Before we open it up for questions, I'd like to mention that we'll be participating in the following conferences in June. The Stiefel Cross-Sector Insights Conference in Boston on June 5th, the Deutsche Bank Industrials Conference in New York on June 6th, the Wells Fargo's Industrial Conference in Chicago on June 12th, and the Jeffries Virtual ESG Conference on June 20th. We look forward to speaking with some of you at those events. That concludes our prepared remarks, and we will now be happy to take your questions. Thanks. Thank you. We'll now be conducting a question and answer session. If you'd like to be placed in the question queue, please press star 1 on your telephone keypad. A confirmation tone will indicate your line is in the question queue. You may press star 2 if you'd like to move your question from the queue. As a reminder, we ask you to please ask one question and one follow-up, and that's star 1 to be placed in the question queue. Our first question today is coming from Josh Spector from UBS. Your line is now live. Yeah, hi. Good morning. Um, so I wanted to ask on one of your prepared comments when you talked about UAN prices higher because the supply demand is tighter in the U.S. through the second quarter. If you can kind of compare that to your comments about pricing moving down through the quarter, obviously there's seasonal factors as a part of that, but when do you think the supply demand in North America becomes maybe more balanced and, and links back to the cost curve versus a tighter dynamic? Damon, why don't you take that one? Yeah. Hey, Josh. How are you doing? Um, look, I, I think there's a couple of elements to your, to your question. So, first of all, we're, we're seeing um, pretty, pretty stable UAM prices. I mean, they, they took a turn up through, through Q1 and the early part of Q2. Um, and really what we've seen, one of the key dynamics playing out here in the US is UAM imports. Um, have been tracking much lower than, than prior years. And so that's created some pockets of opportunity, as I said in my, my earlier remarks, where we've been able to sort of take advantage of that. Um, you know, other factors that are, are going to come into play, we've got urea at the moment. That's The volatility in urea has, I guess, um, created a little bit of uncertainty for, for farmers and, and buyers and so there's, there's forward buying to a little limited extent, but, um, you know, we should see stable prices um, up until we start to see the reset. And, you know, at, at this stage, we're not sure when that will be, but uh, it'll be towards the end of, of Q2. We think there's a bunch of pent-up demand, though, right? Yeah, I think so. Um, in terms of the retailers and, and co-ops, they're, they're buying closer to hand-to-mouth, to -mouth, so... You know, there'll be a time when the application really starts and kicks in and, and there'll be a, a surge of buying activity and, and that'll, that'll support pricing um, right through until we, we get to the end of season. Thanks, Damien. I appreciate that. And I wanted to follow up on some of the, the guidance comments that Cheryl made. Um, I'll skip 2Q, but it seemed like when you were walking through the rest of the year, 
you were talking about, I don't know if I heard you in terms of flat EBITDA for 3Q and 4Q versus prior year, or if you're talking about flat volume. And if it's flat EBITDA, I guess 4Q would be surprising that you'd be calling that this early when I think your guidance on volumes was that volumes would be higher and I expect prices would probably seasonal lift. So can you maybe clarify and talk through some of that? Thanks. Um, yeah, sure, Josh. I think, let me just clarify your question. Um, I did say in the script that, you know, after six consecutive quarters of, you know, lower pricing on a comparative basis that, you know, post Q2, we would start to see, you know, normalization of pricing against the prior years. So we wouldn't have that big decline versus prior year comparative pe uh, periods. Is that the point that you were referring to? Yeah, maybe I misheard pricing versus EBITDA. Um, I, I thought you were starting to guide towards second half EBITDA flat year over year. So if I heard that wrong, then that's um, yeah. I'm no, pretty much answers it. Yeah, just in relation to pricing, not EBITDA. All right, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Adam Samuelson from Goldman Sachs. Roman is now live. Uh, yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Morning, Adam. Morning. Morning. Um, maybe uh, picking up on that last kind of line of questioning is we obviously just kind of gave some framework on EBITDA for the second quarter. No longer thinking pricing would be a year-on-year -year headwind in the second half of the year. Uh, I guess as we would think about what that would net to from a full-year earnings perspective and then bridging to kind of the normalized EBITDA performance that you framed it back at the analyst day a little over a year ago. Um, help us think about the operational uplift still to be realized after this year as we think about operating rates and at the, at the plants. Um, obviously, there would be the incremental uplift from uh, carbon sequestration and, and, and the clean ammonia, but um, just on the, on the plant, plant reliability point, what, what, what can that contribute kind of in 25 and 26, and um, what, what's your confidence level in actually getting there? Yeah, sure, Adam. Um, I think what I would I would probably do is is bridge from 2023, which we were around 133 million of EBITDA. Um, you know, we've spoken to we, in the past about you know call it 35 to 40 million of uplift from improved reliability, and I think what I would point out there is when we're talking about you know going to 95 percent, that's not just on ammonia. We also are assuming that we're not going to sell that product as ammonia. We've got capacity to go downstream in nitric acid, AN solution, and UAN. So there's additional uplift there on that impact from the downstream production. Um, so if you take the 133, you add another 35 to 40 million from improved production. Uh, we are carrying some higher costs right now as we try to accelerate some of these initiatives that we have on, on the go. That's another, call it 10 to 15 million of EBITDA. You know, we've got the urea expansion that we're doing at prior here in the third quarter. Some of those margin enhancement projects should add another five to seven million of EBITDA. And then we've talked about the lapis agreement, and that's another, call it 15 million from carbon sequestration coming online in 2026. Um, so that's how we think about the EBITDA uplift uh, as we go through the next, uh, call it 24 months. Yeah, as Adam, um, as far as confidence in our ability to do it, it's a great question, actually, and so we spent um, probably the last month um, really spending time with our sites and our manufacturing leadership to create a roadmap on how we get to 95% and what it will take. And so I, I would say that we're highly confident that we can get there. Yeah, that's helpful. And then uh, maybe another one for Cheryl, just on the balance sheet. Uh, you bought back some stock. You also bought back um, some of the some of the notes in the quarter and seemingly further in, in April. Um, do you have a, a total target in mind for what you would be looking at to, from a capital deployment perspective in terms of buyback and, and debt repurchase this year? Yeah, I think that um, – so we bought back $75 million of debt to date and we've bought back um, another 10 to 12 million of, of, of stock. stock yep. So I think we've allocated about $125 million uh, to buy back a combination of debt and stock, and then we'll kind of take a breather there, see where we are, 
um, see where some of our projects are and what our cash needs are, and then we'll make a decision on whether we move forward with continued purchases or not. All right, that's uh, that's uh, really helpful. I'll pass it on. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Next question is coming from David Begbiter from Deutsche Bank. Your line is now live. Thank you. Good morning. Uh, Mark, just looking at natural gas prices, how are you thinking about uh, taking advantage of these uh, lower prices over the longer term? Well, you know, it's a great question, and, I've, um, you know, we debate this internally, and we've debated it for the last, you know, five years. Um, we seem to, you know, want to take some um, – we've, we've tried taking some, I'd call it forward purchases because they're not really hedges. Um, and, you know, we've won some of them, and, and last year, unfortunately, we actually lost in a big way, right? We lost uh, the potential for, call it, $40 million dollars based on locking in at higher prices when the actual prices were somewhat lower. Um, so I think we're taking the position right now that um, we lock in, we make sure that we have enough gas at the beginning of every month to lock in 90% of our gas needs. And that's, you know, combined with if we have any forward purchases of product, you know, primarily on the fertilizer side where we lock in the gas to lock in our margin there. Um, if we've got any customers on the industrial side, since they're primarily um, gas pass-through that want, a lot, want us to lock it in, which doesn't happen very often, very infrequent. Actually, we'll lock that in as well. But going in and purchasing um, forward uh, to really make a bet on where natural gas prices are going to be, you know, there's a lot of conflicting views in the marketplace on um, prices going up um, come towards the end of this year and into next year. And then you read a whole lot of other conflicting views on how much natural gas is actually coming out of the ground. And, of course, we've got LNG issues and what's going on there. So I think our strategy right now is to continue to buy um, you know, primarily first of the month to lock in that gas. Um, and then we're starting to think about the winter. And do we actually uh, hedge or buy, buy forward some gas in the winter where it can be somewhat more volatile? Understood. And and just on the uh, buying debt versus stock, how do you decide, you know, the use of, you know, what's more beneficial to uh, to you guys, stock or debt at any, at any point, any time? Thank you. Well, I think, you know, first we've, you know, Cheryl's been pretty public in saying that, um, you know, our target is two and a half times leverage, right? And so we say two and a half times leverage on mid-market EBITDA, which is the $200 million that Cheryl referred to earlier. So that would be $500 million. So we're pretty much at $500 million with that $75 million um, repurchase of debt. You know, um, to make ourselves a, a bit more bulletproof and to allow us to continue to weather any storms and also fund capital projects, you know, I think we would consider delevering somewhat more um, just to give more comfort, right? We're in a, a somewhat volatile industry where pricing can move, you know, relatively quickly, and the last thing we want to do is ever be in an over-levered position. So I think that's the first thing we think about, you know, when we think about debt. Um, we're lucky enough that we certainly have enough cash and liquidity that we can do both debt and stock. And right now, um, I hope I'm not going out there on a limb, but <laughs> I think we all believe that our stock is uh, pretty undervalued. So I think that, you know, buying back some stock at these levels makes a lot of sense for us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Next question today is coming from Andrew Wong from RBC Capital Markets. Your line is now live. Hey, good morning. Thanks for taking my questions. Um, I could you just maybe talk about your view on ammonium nitrate prices going forward? It seems like the premiums have come down a little bit versus urea. Uh, maybe just what's driving that, and um, you know, could could we see that rebound going forward? Yeah. Good morning, Andrew. I, I think you'll see a little bit of rebound going forward as we um, get into more more application and, and some of that natural demand for for AN comes through. Um, but in, in terms of some of those those trends, you know, I think there's there's been some some changes in demand in the in the marketplace, and you know what what we tend to see is that if pricing for for AN gets gets too high, then you'll start to incentivise some switching um, to urea. So 
we're constantly sort of working against some of those dynamics, but um, you know, I think we're we're happy with with where things are at right at this very minute. Okay, thank you. And then um, maybe just talk about the collaboration with Emoji. I think I'm saying that right. Um, looks like initial testing is in Q3. What is the what is the opportunity for LSB around that? Um, you know, if it's a successful test. Well, look, I think um, one of the things that people are now starting to really talk about when we're talking about, um, you know, low-carbon um, development and, and this whole energy transition is um, we can build all the facilities we want, but it's really going to be demand-driven. And I think when we started our conversations with Amogy and, um, and talking about how we can work together, so they've got... Um, you know, system power to X that uh, allows people to um, basically convert um, existing engines to uh, run on ammonia because they've got ammonia to a fuel cell, fuel cell to hydrogen, and hydrogen into the to the engine. Um, so part of what we're, we talked about was really working together to develop the inland marine marketplace here in the United States. Um, that's a big market. A lot of vessels going up and down the rivers. A um, lot of, of dirty fuel used, um, and so for them to sell systems, there needs to be the availability of low-carbon ammonia, and for us to sell low-carbon ammonia into that marketplace, there needs to be engines that can run on that, so it really, it's kind of like hand and glove in the way that it fits, so we're really working with them to, do, to try and develop that market and really work with Washington um, to really understand the opportunity and uh, work with U.S. Coast Guard to, to get them to understand what it would take and get the right permitting. And I think that's why, I believe that's why their test has been delayed, um, which was supposed to happen towards the end of last year, is that it's, you know, taken longer to educate, um, you know, uh, the political scene and, as well as Coast Guard. Um, but I think they've made a lot of progress, so we're excited about that. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. As a reminder, that's star one to be placed into question queue. Our next question is coming from Rob McGuire from Granite Research. Your line is now live. Rob, perhaps your phone is on mute. Thanks so much. Uh, good morning. Could you please talk about your healthy increase in downstream production volumes? Uh, perhaps just elaborate on what's behind that and if you think it could, uh, could continue on a year-over-year -year basis. Uh, for the remainder of 2024. Yeah, good morning, Rob. Um, but basically, with we're sold out on all of our downstream plants, so as we get improved performance from those assets, then we're in a good position to, to sell them and increase the, the volumes. And that's exactly what we've been doing right across the, the board. So it's, it's pretty simple in, in that aspect. Yeah, I think, in fact, we've got... Um, about 200,000 tons of ammonia that we sell um, in El Dorado um, and inject into the pipeline to a customer that we'd love to find a way, and we're working diligently to find a way to upgrade. So I think we've still got some more upgrading capabilities. We'll take some more capital to do that, mm -hmm. um, like an expansion that we've talked about in the past. Um, but um, we think that there's certainly margin enhancement as we move forward. Yeah, and the other bit of margin enhancement that we, we continually revise is, is basically what's the mix, right, and how do we optimise that mix and what's the position on, on pricing or, or term of contract or, or whatever we take on, on those upgrades. So, um, yeah. Yeah, and I think one other thing I would point out, Rob, is if you're when you're thinking about Q1 to Q2, um, we and I kind of alluded to it in the script, we expect to see further increase in volumes on all of our downstream production for UAN, AN, and um, nitric acid. And then, of course, you'll see a, a corresponding decrease in ammonia sales um, as we look to continue to upgrade further. Well, that's helpful from all three of you. Thank you. Uh, moving on, uh, how would you characterize the strength of the spring application, and what does that tell you about future demand? Uh, in other words, I, I could you also talk about it? You know, if you think there was a pull forward from 2Q into 2 uh, into Q1, you kind of touched on it in the comments. But if you could elaborate, I'd appreciate it. 
Yeah, look, I think um, the way the, the season is setting up, it's, it's looking pretty good. Uh, planting is, is running a, ahead of the five-year average. I think in the last report, we're about, about 27% versus 22% on average. So that's all pointing to, to a good season. Um, look, clearly we had a, a really strong uh, pre-plant run on ammonia. Um, but we're, we're now really focused on what that means for UAN and some of the other nitrogen products, and and we think we're um, you know we're well positioned to take advantage of whatever the the season throws at us, and we're confident that it'll be a pretty healthy uh, spring this year. Okay, I appreciate that. And then lastly, can, can you you kind of touched on this in the past. But uh, can you discuss the mining industry's push to decrease or its carbon footprint? Are they under different pressure than the rest of corporate America, or is it it's just simply they're they're keeping up with everyone else? Uh, that's an interesting question. It's probably a bit of a bit of both, I think. Um, you know, look, they the, the mining industry is is trying to to decarbonise, and some of the the big producers. Um, have a really strong effort on that. You know, they've all got sustainability reports and and people responsible for for driving improvements there. So, um, you know, we, we're seeing some of that come through in some of our discussions with them on on our low carbon offerings as we we look to commission our project at El Dorado. So, you know, I think we're well placed to take advantage of that. Um, and you know, we you know we hope that they continue to try and push. Uh, to decarbonise their supply chains. But just to follow on, do you think that there's more demand for low carbon ammonia in the next few years when you start producing coming from mining or industrial? Is it probably going to look about the same? Oh, I think it'll look about the same. It's hard to split the... Um. Please stand by. We're experiencing technical difficulties. Please do not disconnect. Please stand by. Once again, please stand by while I reconnect the speaker line. Please do not disconnect. Thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please stand by. We are experiencing some technical difficulties while I reconnect the speaker line. I do apologize for the inconvenience, everyone. Please stand by while I reconnect the speaker line. We do thank you for your patience. Now rejoining our speakers. This speaker line has now rejoined. Great. Um, and I believe Rob, you were you were online for a question, Rob. Yes, indeed. Uh, just touching base on. Uh, sorry about that. Uh, 
are, are, I, I'm just going to move on if you don't mind. Are there any meaningful upgrades taking place in the turnarounds to uptick your on-stream rate? Yeah, Rob, we've got a, a urea expansion that we're pursuing and implementing at, at Prior, and that'll um, that'll help us produce another 60 to 70 thousand tonnes of, of UAN per year. Um, and the rest of the turnaround scope's really for both um, sites, Prior and Cherokee, is really going to be focused on improving reliability. Yeah, so we expect to come out of the turnarounds um, with much higher operating rates and. Uh, you know, and that obviously uh, would just improve um, product for sale. So, yeah, we're looking for – these are major turnarounds for us. We're very focused on them, and actually it's a fair amount of capital that we're deploying to, into the turnarounds. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Our next question today is coming from Charles Niebert from Piper Sandler. Your line is now live. All right, guys, just one quick question. The – SCNA percentage seems to be on the rise lately. Is there any particular reason for it? Uh, should we expect it to stay at the higher level, or is it going to come back to where it had been over the last couple of years? Yeah, Charlie, I think you're going to see us carry an extra 10 to $15 million in SGNA um, for the next uh, 12 to 18 months, maybe 24 months, as we um, push – um, reliability program. Some of that is obviously rolling up to um, the cost of sales, uh, but some of it we're carrying uh, up at, as corporate overhead. So um, we would see once we achieve the reliability rates that we've outlined, um, we definitely should see some reduction in expense. Okay, and then the other, in terms of you know the like a net debt to EBITDA multiple. Do you guys have a target in mind? I mean, admittedly, EBITDA has been moving around a little bit over the last year, so you're trailing 12 months has seen some big movement. But when things, for lack of a better terms, begin to level off and get you know less, less volatile, do you guys have a target in mind as to where you'd like to be when it all works its way through? Yeah, no more than two and a half times levered. All right, that's all for me. Thanks. Gas has come down quite a bit. Obviously, it's still much higher than the U.S., but having seen, you know, where it was, forgetting the obviously incredibly high numbers, but, you know, where it is now, does it seem like you're going to see some of that European production come back online? You know, at $450 for ammonia, it might not be exceptionally profitable, but it might be enough to keep them in the game considering, you know, they've got the protection of somebody having to move product into the area. Uh, it just might be easier for them that way. Do you see any in increase in European production because of the lower gas numbers coming out of there? Look, I think um, the European producers will probably want to see some more sustained uh, pricing levels in order to get some confidence to, to restart operations. So I think there's still a lot of um, water to pass under the bridge um, in that aspect. I, I think that uh, plants that have restarted uh, will, will continue on, and I think we'll see a little bit of the status quo continue for, for some months. I also think it depends on, you know, import prices versus cost of production, right? And so where right. those levels are. And so I think if gas is low here and, you know, gas is... Um, much higher in Europe, but relatively low compared to where it's been over the last several years. Um, you know, that puts a cap sort of on ammonia prices in general. Might be still cheaper for them to import. So I think it's really just a total economic decision. Do you see anyone throwing in the towel completely, sort of like in the way CF chose to close the UK ammonia operation, but to supply ammonia from the outside? Any of those, any of the current players in and around Europe who might consider closure in either substitution or just outright closure of the facility? Oh, look, not that um, that we've heard of, of late. I think um, most of the, the producers like, like CF and, and BASF, um, you know, they, they've already made their moves. A couple of you Eastern know. Europeans have closed down facilities. Yeah, but I, I think the, um, you know, the, the rest are probably, um, you know, those that are operating are, are happy to do so, and um, those that are suspended or, or shut down, you know, I, we haven't heard anything of, of that turning into a permanent closure. 
I think the only thing that um, people will start to face after some period of time is you can't just shut down a facility. <laughs> you it's do have to. Yeah. It's expensive to maintain it, right? Because you have to be able to maintain it so that you can turn it back on. So at some point, I think the cost of maintenance will force some decisions. Okay, that's it for me. Thanks, Doug. Thank you. We reached the end of our question and answer session. I'd like to turn the floor back over to management for any further closing comments. Thank you. Uh, as always, thanks so much for your interest in, uh, in LSB Industries. And if you have any follow-up calls or, or follow-up questions, feel free to call us, and we'll be happy to answer them. Thank you. Have a great day. Thank you. That does conclude today's teleconference. Let me just connect your line at this time and have a wonderful day. We thank you for your participation today.